Welcome to Map Crow, the RPG art show. My name is Kyle, and today we are talking about color theory. This video is brought to you by the generous contributions of my lovely backers of the Map Crow Patreon. If you would like to get digital terrain and minis delivered directly to your email inbox every month, just head on over to patreon.com slash mapcrow and pledge today. In my years as an art educator, I find that my students just kind of believe that there's something really complicated and mysterious about color theory. And to be honest, I think it's probably just because it has the word theory in it. But it doesn't have to be complicated. As long as we remember that colors are actually made out of three basic components and how they interact with one another, that's basically all you need to know. If we pull up the hue saturation window, we can see the basic building blocks of every color your eye can possibly see. And that is hue, saturation, and lightness. Hue is kind of what we usually think of as color. It is the mixture of light waves at a frequency that uh, indicates to our eyeballs that we need to be seeing red, yellow, blue, green, violet, all those kinds of crayon box colors. That is the hue. The saturation is how close to gray a color is. So if we kind of move the saturation down, uh, we can see that uh, our, our image becomes grayscale. Now this is really handy because adjusting saturation leaves us with only the final component of color, that is to say lightness or value. You might consider how close a color is to white or black to be its lightness or value. Black would be the lowest value a color could have and the lightest value that a color could have would be white. Oftentimes the best way to describe the palette that I'm using is that it is based off of comic book printing from the 70s. You may also notice on the screen off to the right of the color wheel I have the color swatches that I use to color almost everything. Now if you know anything about the color wheel, the arrangements of pigments kind of around in a circle kind of being determined by the mixture of primary colors yellow, red, and blue, you probably learned about this with paint. We are going to say that our primary colors are yellow, blue, and red, as if we are mixing paints instead of pixels. You may also be familiar with the concept of a color scheme. This is to say when a character design or a composition has specific colors chosen that go together and mix with one another in a specific way. Let's start talking about color schemes by looking at the colors I used for this Roper Mini. All right, with the colors mapped over to the color wheel, we can kind of see what's going on a little bit more clearly. We can see that this color scheme might be best described as a triad. All of these colors are basically mapped to red, blue, and yellow. The red in the eyeball and all of these kind of tentacle tongues is the most saturated red that we see on the palette. The yellow is really coming into the conversation with these warm grays. And then I also have this nice cool gray off to the left side of this figure. The reason I did this is to give the monster just a little bit more depth of color and uh, to deepen the palette. It helps create the illusion that this is a round cone shape that is catching light from all kinds of different places. Places. The high saturation red colors are drawing a lot of attention to the important parts of this creature, while the low saturation blues and yellows exist to form the basic structure, so until the roper opens up its eye and its mouth, it might just look like a normal rock, ready to pounce on unsuspecting adventurers. If we look at the corpse-eating, ghost-puking dragon from a previous episode of Map Crow, we can see that this is also a triad color scheme. The more saturated aspects of this color scheme also kind of make a triangle between red, yellow, and blue. But there are a lot more colors than the previous monster. Most of them kind of coming together in the center, uh, closer to gray, closer to this desaturated area. The closer to gray that colors are, the kind of easier it is and the less jarring it is for the eye to mix these colors. Let me show you what I mean. If we turn the saturation all the way up on all of our colors, 
it's going to look like, you know, maybe a cool blacklight poster, but the whole thing kind of hurts the eyes to look at. The desaturated colors are not only tying the whole palette together to create what some painters call a color conversation, they also allow for an emphasis of hue. If everything is just, you know, saturated to all get out, uh, it can be somewhat difficult to break down the image into the shapes that uh, best communicate how one is to look at it. If we look at this armored serpent man, we can see that there is a different kind of triad scheme, a secondary triad scheme. That is to say that the triad does not use yellow, red, and blue, but instead green, orange, and violet. The secondary colors that you get from mixing each of the primary colors together. If you think about comic book villains, like the Green Goblin, or the Joker, or Lex Luthor when he's in his power armor, you're oftentimes going to end up with a secondary triad color scheme. And this is because most of the superheroes, like Batman, Captain America, Wonder Woman, are all already kind of camping on the primary colors. So if we want to differentiate these characters visually, we need to go with a different scheme. So if you want to give your character design just sort of like a little bit of a sinister edge, start working in some secondary colors. Obviously, there's no like cosmic moral alignment of colors that uh, we need to worry about. This is just about cultural association. Different cultures have different kinds of associations with different colors, but if you're working in tabletop games or comic book illustration in America or Europe, a lot of those strong associations already exist. And it's up to you as the artist to decide if you want to subvert or embrace Embrace those associations. Let's turn the image of the Serpent Man grayscale so that we can evaluate the value contrast. In this case, we have a lot of our values clustering in the mid-tone area, around the 50% gray between white and black. We're using the purple of the tunic and the hood to show the value contrast between the armor and the torso to allow the eye to figure things out even more quickly. That said, there's a lot of armor pieces that are all the same colors that are overlapping. So to make sure that the head stands out, I kind of added this very, very high value yellow to the top of the headdress. And I'm just relying on my line art to carry the darkest value values of black into the composition. Now, when it comes to this skeletal serpent man, I knew that one of the major colors I was going to be using was this very bright yellow, this off-white, this eggshell color for all the bones as well as these kind of shiny gold metallic colors that I have been using for all of their weapons so far. Knowing that, I decided to introduce a complementary color scheme with this character. So almost all of the colors that I'm using that aren't based in some kind of yellow or orange, I'm using purple or violet, which is opposite on the color wheel from yellow. This is to create hue contrast. We've already talked about value contrast, but this is hue contrast. When we are using colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, this creates an activity between these two hues that the eye often finds very stimulating and exciting. It might have been more appropriate or accurate or believable to go with a more desaturated palette and allow these burial bandages, this burial shroud, to be desaturated and yellowy as well. But you can see how that completely flattens the palette. It doesn't make a very good design to do realistic color schemes. What makes good design is what appeals to the eye. And if we increase the saturation to the point of melting your eyeballs, we can see how this complementary color scheme is really operating. How the purples are placed on the figure to help separate each form. So you can see the face is separated from the torso, the torso separated from the hips. And also I'm bringing in some purple bandages on the arm and the tail to kind of bring it into the conversation and unify the design. If we take a look at this mimic chest that is opened up with all of these grasping undead arms pouring out of it, we can see another kind of complementary scheme, an off complement. The hands are all kind of desaturated yellow-greens. An opposite yellow-green would be 
you know, a red violet or something like that. But instead of coloring the chest its direct complement, we are going with an off complement, something directly to the left or the right of its actual complement. So in this case, contrasting green with these orange colors and yellow colors in the chest is creating this off complement, which is a less obvious complement, it still gets us that nice strong hue contrast without turning this image into Christmas colors. If we increase the saturation and bring in those direct complements, we can see kind of like how goofy and out of place. It kind of downplays the horror and increases the sort of goofiness, which is not necessarily a bad move, but it's not really the move that I wanted to make. And if we take a look at the original color scheme in grayscale, we can also see that there's just enough value contrast to show you where the shiny bits of metal are, um, but most of the contrast is achieved through the black of the line work. Now, so far, for the sake of simplicity, I have been turning off the extra effects that I'm using, the extra shadows and highlights and rim lights and halos effects that I'm adding to all of my minis. But we can also see how this helps a lot of that value value contrast. So this, what we see here with this extra kind of bright yellow line that's going around the outside of it, is the actual mini that you would download if you buy one of my asset packs. If we turn it grayscale, we can see that I am making sure that we have not only the darkest value black, but something really, really close to white kind of jammed together. So when you're zoomed out and you're looking at all of these minis on the virtual tabletop together, they can all stand out. And and no matter what kind of background or terrain or other minis they're next to, they're all going to be able to be separated by the eye because of the high value contrast I am introducing with these highlights and rim lights and halo effects. If we take a look at this poor soup slime that I created, we can see a new color scheme called the analogous color scheme. An analogous color scheme is kind of like an off complement color scheme, except there is a more smooth gradation from one color to another. In this image, we can see that our colors are fanned out from yellow into orange and into red. This allows us to achieve color depth while staying very intentional about the colors that we are using. I've introduced just a little bit of dark red violet into the bottom parts of this uh, creature to make sure that we are getting enough hue contrast to separate our highlights from our shadows. Oftentimes for shadows, you want to make sure that the shadows are reading just a little bit cooler than the parts of your character that are getting um, most direct light. We can also see a little trick I'm using here by coloring the line art. It indicates that this is a shiny, wet, sticky, lustery surface. And just to be extra confusing, let's also talk about the monochromatic color scheme, which is like the analogous color scheme, except worse. In the case of the monochromatic color scheme, if you take a look at the color wheel map, you can see that basically all I am using is different values of the exact same desaturated yellow. This is because I wanted to have petrified serpent men who I could place nearby this basilisk I also made for this set. I would only use a monochromatic color scheme if I wanted things to look flat and dead and uninteresting on purpose. Really, I want this character to almost fade into the background and be considered part of the scenery more than I want them to be thought of as an active character on the scene. If I put a bunch of these minis together, you can see how often I return to exactly the same desaturated yellows and browns frequently to create this sense of kind of unity, but also give the whole line of minis this kind of you know, gritty, sky rimmy, gross, grimy thing. This is not brightly colored Camelot. This is, you know, grim fantasy, dark fantasy stuff. People are walking around in mud. They're always covered in dust. And I am communicating tone and setting just through the color palette. And I can unify the whole line of minis by using similar colors for similar reasons. If you can figure out how to use those color schemes and use saturation, hue, and value contrast, you know all you really need to know 
for color theory. That, that's all color theory is. Color theory isn't that complicated. The execution of it can be highly nuanced, but it's not complicated. I think that just about does it for this episode. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you like the minis that you are seeing on the screen right now, you can head over to my itch store or my Patreon and download them and start using them on your favorite virtual tabletop. Also, something else I have been working into these minis is some of the monsters from this channel's Building Better Monster videos. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to work up some encounter scenarios so you can fight my owl bear and you can fight my uh, corpse eating ghost puking dragon so uh, keep an eye out for that in the future but that really does it for this video so until next time my friends farewell <laughs>